वेलकम टू यूरो पाइथन माई नेम इज मयंक एंड आई एम आर डेटा साइंटिस्ट एट एस थ्री सो माई टॉक इज अबाउट अर्थ ऑब्जर्वेशन थ्रू लार्ज विजन मॉडल्स सो आई वर्क मेनली ऑन इंटरसेक्शन ऑफ सैटेलाइट डेटा एंड ए आई सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड वट इज अर्थ ऑब्जर्वेशन एंड हाउ डू वी ऑब्जर्व इवेंट्स ऑकरिंग ऑन अर्थ सो information gathering of information about earth physical chemical and biological systems is known as earth observation and we can do that with the help of various sensors like thermometers for uh, temperature barometer for air pressure soil moisture sensor and seismograph for measuring the intensity of earthquake now all of these are ground based observations which we do from the place of occurrence the next is remote sensing which we do from the distance from the place of occurrence and that can be done by putting the sensors on airplanes drones satellites and ships and they provide a wide angle view of a particular area so in this talk we are going to mainly focusing on satellite data set what are satellites there are a lot of satellites orbiting around the earth at more than 600 kilometers above its surface and each of these satellites has specific sensors like gps for location there are communication sensors there's magnetic field sensors gravitational sensors and most of these satellites have imagery sensors so there are various sectors which are dependent upon satellite data set like urban planning so whenever there's a need of construction of bridges railways or tram stations a planning needs to be done which can be done with the help of overhead imagery agriculture so it can be useful for identifying the crop health so do you see red trees in this imagery so this is the infrared radiation getting reflected by the trees and it can be quite helpful in identifying the crop health before it is even visible to our eyes disaster management so there are various specialized satellites which works like a radar system and they can send the microwaves which can even penetrate through clouds and hence it can be used for observing the earth on a cloudy day and also it can be useful for weather forecasting as well so what's the journey of uh, data from orbit to analysis so there are a lot of satellites and they have different orbits some are geostationary satellites which remains fixed with respect to the earth surface there are low earth orbit satellites medium earth orbit satellites so ground station needs to be located strategically on the surface of earth based on the speed of these satellites so data is sent through high powered antennas to these ground station and after that data is sent for processing so here during processing noise removal is done and data is calibrated based on the sensors and after that it is converted into a readable image format storage and distribution now the data uh, is stored into large databases and then it is distributed over various platforms which we are going to see in the next slide analysis now this is where the magic happens trained analysts or deep learning professionals use this satellite data set in order to get some outcome out of out of it now here are various data platform you can download satellite data set for free like earth data from nasa aws Sentinel Hub, Bhuvan from Indian Space Research Organization, Copernicus from European Space Agency, and USGS. So all of these platforms provide different types of satellite data set. Some of them might have high resolution. Some of them might have different number of bands, and so on. So here you can see uh, example of Copernicus browser. You just need to provide the area of extent you want to download. uh the date and time type of satellite data you want and you can click on search after that you will get the links to download the satellite data set now once we have the uh, imagery how can we create algorithm which can identify how many bridges are there number of boats or what's the color of the water in this image or where exactly is the roundabout then can be quite useful for urban planning and can we even increase the resolution of this image so we can take the help of deep learning to do that <coughs> now if you compare a satellite image with a regular image you'll see that satellite image has much more pixels as compared to a regular image 
Hence, our deep learning model won't be able to process all of it at once. So we divide it into smaller chips in order to <coughs> do the processing. So here's a general deep learning workflow goes. We take the data and we split that into training and validation set. Then we train the model. And after that, we evaluate it on the validation set. So based on the evaluation score, we save it as a predictive model. And if we are not satisfied with the score, we fine tune it until we get a better score. Now, once we have a trained model, we can use it for various tasks. Like here, we are using it for classification. We can classify airplanes versus cars, or we can detect airplanes and cars in this example. Now, this is uh, supervised learning, and once we have a model, it can only classify these two classes. Now, what if we have a requirement that we want to classify or detect red cars, or a car with a sunroof? So, we'll have to go through the whole training process again. We'll have to label the red cars, add to the data set, and retain. Or we can add language into it. So this is where multimodal deep learning can be helpful. So here we can take the help from different modalities like vision, audio, and text. And then create a better representation of the data, which can be helpful to learn the model better. And then we can save it as a predictive model. So we have to create a shared representation for this data. Like here in this example, we can uh, give a data type like text, dog barking, image, and a video for the same. We pass it to a multimodel, which contains various encoders, which can convert it into em embedding space. So if the values of embeddings are similar, it would be put into a separate space in this space. And similarly, for a different class, like cars honking in the city, and the audio of that, it will be put into a different place in this space dependent upon the class. So here you can see, irrespective of the type of data we pass, it will be placed into a shared representation space. Now, you must have seen various vision language models, uh, which are available on platforms like Kaggle or Hugging Face. Like you give a prompt and image, it will provide you the whole list of ingredients. Like here we have provided uh, a prompt that give me a recipe of these cookies and it will provide the list of ingredients and the recipe of these cookies. Similarly, here's another interesting use case. We have revenue growth of different sectors like food delivery, classifieds, payments, ed tech. Now we ask a model to analyze the contents of this image as a markdown table and here it has created it as a markdown table. Now, which of the businesses units has the highest revenue growth? So here, the classified has the highest revenue growth. The model is able to predict it based on looking at this image. Now, what if we use these models on satellite data set? Here's an example of image captioning model. Uh, now, this model gives the caption by providing the image. Here, we have provided a satellite image, and it has given the pro uh, caption that an aerial view of a city with buildings. Now, you can see there's a lot more than the city with buildings. There's a ground field, there's a tennis court, a swimming pool, and there are many more things. So, we want more information out of the model instead of this generalized information. Similarly, here you can see, uh, we asked the model to detect airplanes and windmills. So it has detected this windmill as an airplane, as its propeller is looking like the propeller of an airplane. So we need to fine tune these models. So before moving ahead, let's see what challenges do we face with satellite data. So objects are quite small on satellite data set satellite images, and they are composed of just few pixels. So if a model is trained on low resolution images, it won't perform well on high resolution, or vice versa. So change in resolution affects the performance of model hugely. 
position of the sun. So some images might be overexposed. As you can see on the right, there are very high reflections from the objects and you are not even able to see the road properly due to reflection. And there might be a darker regions in the image, like you see a lot of shadows in this image. So models won't be able to perform well in these images as well. Bad weather. So if there are clouds, there are snow or there's haze. So we got us only one shot for a specific area at a specific time. So our model should be able to work well in these conditions as well. And the last is uh, angle which satellite makes with the Earth's surface. Uh, a lot of taller objects might look different from different angles. So model won't be able to identify that from different angles as well. Now let's see how can we fine tune these multimodals, which are vision language models. <coughs> so we'll start with clip. So this is, uh, this is the most fundamental multimodal based on which other models have been developed. As, as the name says, it is based on contrastive learning for training. And this model has been created by OpenAI, which uses images along with their captions as a training data set. So the main goal here is to pull the correct image and text pairs towards each other and push the incorrect ones away from each other. So this is how contrastive loss works. Here you can see uh, we have a text encoder and image encoder. We take batch of text and batch of images and pass it to the encoder, which converts them into embeddings. Now these embeddings uh, are used to create a, a cosine similarity between them. So here we calculate the cosine similarity between all the combination of embedding like I1, T1, I2, T2, or I1, T3. So at the main diagonal, you will see the correct image text pair. And at the off diagonal, you'll see incorrect image text pair. So our main goal here is to increase the similarity at the main diagonal and decrease it at the off diagonal elements. So this is how the model learns and the weights gets updated. So once we have a trained model, it can, uh, given a list of text and image, it will be able to provide the probability based on the prompt we provide. So here you see a satellite image of a roundabout, image of an intersection, satellite image of a church, and image of a roundabout has a highest probability. Similarly, for airplanes, uh, cropland, and building. Now, let's see where do we, where can we use clip model? So it can be used for zero shot image classification. So just like we saw a red car example, there in that example, we can ask a model to classify the red car in that image, and it will be able to give the high probability for that, or the car with the sunroof. So this is how zero shot learning works. We can uh, just give a prompt and model doesn't require any training for that specific class. And image search. We can provide a prompt and model will be able to extract all the images from the data set. And based on that, we can search the images. Here you can see an example. We give a prompt that three cars were driving on the bridge opposite to a green river. So the model has extracted all the images opposite uh, a bridge opposite to a green river. And here you see there are exactly three cars based on the performance of the model. It has ranked it as three. And similarly for other examples. So it can also be used for conditional image generation for text to image models. Now you must have seen various models like DAL-E or stable diffusion, which can generate images based on the text you provide. So if we don't condition those models, they will generate images randomly. Now those models can be conditioned with the help of clip. That's why we are able to provide the text and the image gets generated. And in the reverse, it can also be used to generate the caption based on the image. So once we pass the image, it will be able to generate caption from that image. And that can be done by combining clip with a generative text model. And at last, clip score can be used for evaluation as well. So we can download various multi uh, models from online platforms. We can use a pre-trained clip model in order to evaluate different models which suits best for our use case.
So let's see how can we fine tune this model. We're, we'll be going to use PyTorch and a pre-trained model for open, from OpenAI in order to fine tune it. <clears throat> so first we provide the image path and the path for the captions. And here we are providing the OpenAI model which is loaded from clip and the preprocessor which will be used for processing our images. Then we create a custom uh, class which will be used to create a custom data loader. Uh, here we are processing, uh, tokenizing our text and pre-processing our images based on the OpenAI model and which will be returning image and in their captions. So here we are creating a data loader with a batch size 50 and passing a custom uh, data set class. Then we are creating an optimizer which, which will be useful for fine tuning our model. Now here after that we are creating a cross entropy loss. Now here uh, we are not using contrast loss as we are fine tuning it for a downstream task which is satellite data set. Now here's a training loop which is in PyTorch and you just have to provide a model which, uh, which is given you the prediction of logics and the ground truth. We can use the loss for uh, text and the images, add them up and we update the gradients and update the model parameters. As simple as that. So this is how we can fine tune clip model. Now, this is a place in USA which is famous for clubs and casinos. Does anyone wants to guess what place is this? Yeah. Yeah. This is a Vegas and this image is from 2018 and on the right, on the left we have image from 2014. Now how many of you can think that, can identify they are, there are more than approx 100 differences in this image? And how about more than 1000 at this particular resolution? So there are approximately 100 differences in these two images and this is called chain detection and it can be quite helpful in identifying the urban development happened over the past few years or it can be useful for doing environmental monitoring like deforestation or glacial melting is happening over a place. It can be useful for monitoring that or it can be useful for defense. If there's some illegal mining activity happening over some place or some illegal activity at the border, it can be useful for that as well and disaster management. So there are a various use cases we can think of which can be done with the help of chain detection. Now let's see how can we use um, vision language model in order to detect change. So we can use image, do image change ca uh, captioning in order to do that. So we provide a past image and a future image. Model will be able to provide how many houses have been built along this road based on these two images. Similarly, here it has given a caption that a small green area appears in the desert. So based on this uh, information, we can filter out the relevant information and remove the rest. Now imagine there's an earthquake at a particular area and your task is to identify the building which have been damaged due to earthquake and send the reinforcements here as quickly as possible. So this is where object detection comes into action. So it can provide the approximate counts of number of objects in that particular area and it can localize those uh, objects by providing the bounding box and the coordinates of those areas. With the help of that, we can identify the relative distance of those multiple objects and we can send the reinforcements there quickly which can be efficient. So there are various models which are being used like YOLO, SSD, faster RCNN and those models can be trained on fixed number of classes. Like it can be useful for detecting ships, airplanes or trucks and buildings. So there are various applications we can think of. Now let's see how can we use vision models in that case as well. So it can be used for zero shot object detection. You just have to provide a prompt and it will be able to detect the, those objects. Now 
we just have to describe the object we want to detect like the oval large screen and red ground track field it will detect it for you and similarly a short large overpass now it can also refer uh, which object we want to detect like here we want to detect the chimney on the left we just have to provide a prompt it will detect the left chimney and filter out the other ones and similarly here ship on the top so it is able to refer what object we are trying to identify so we can use grounding you know in order to do that it is an open source model which is based uh, built by idea research and it is based on top of built on top of detection transformer and it learns with both detection and grounding data what it means that it would require images the captions and a bounding box on those images and the caption should uh, describe what's inside that bounding box not the whole image just like we did in clip model and it can be used for doing zero shot object detection just like we saw in the last slide and it can pinpoint exactly which part of the image correspond to which part of the text now let's see how does this model works this is the whole architecture so initially we are going to use a uh, swin transformer and bird as a text backbone and image backbone which will convert into image and text features now these features are then passed to feature enhancer so feature enhancer uh, use attention mechanism in order to fuse the uh, feature from image and text now let's see what happens in feature enhancer so here we are passing text and image to a self attention layer now what self attention layer does is it identifies the relationship within the image features and within the text features after that we use image to text cross attention so what it does is it fuses images and text so it processes text here with the help of key and value and query from images and the next it is processing images with the help of text by taking key and value from image and query from text after that we pass it to a feed forward layer then the weights get updated now once we have updated features we use a language guided query selection which selects a number of queries and filter out the rest which are not required by our model so here we select the relevant queries and filter out the rest which are sent to cross modality decoder now what decoder does is further fuses image and text pairs and then it predicts the bounding boxes now the predicted bounding boxes with the class is sent for loss so here we are using contrastive loss just like we saw in clip and the localization loss which will be used for identifying the uh, loss between the predicted bounding box and the original bounding box and in a nutshell this is how this model works so we can use mm detection library in order to fine tune this model now we just have to create a config file where we can provide type of model we want here we are passing the number of queries which are 900 in this case which were used for decoder and after that we are passing the preprocessor which will be used for processing uh, the images and then we are passing bert model and swin transformer which will which are our encoder models and here we are passing a uh, visual layer configuration text layer and fusion layer configuration just like we saw in a fusion of text and image enhancer here like we saw in a feature enhancer similarly we are creating this encoder after that we are creating a decoder which contains self attention cross attention and uh, for text and images and after that we create a loss function which will be used in config files so here we are passing the arguments for contrastive loss and the bounding box loss so these arguments are currently set for satellite data set they can be set for different domains like medical imagery or fashion imagery and so on now here we are using uh, mm detection which will be used to load the config file we just created here we are passing the 
image directory and after that we pass the annotation which are our labels and after that we just have to run the runner which will be train uh, which will train our model after that we can use the inferencer where we can pa uh, pass the path for a config file and we can pass the weights which were trained uh, from this api and after that we create a inferencer which where we are passing the image file and the prompt now here we are passing a prompt that we want to detect golf field so after training a model for like 20 epochs it is able to detect these golf field in this area now this was for vision language models now let's see how can we increase the resolution of these images with the help of super resolution model so what do you mean by resolution of an image it's just amount of information inside an image like it can have number of pixels more number of channels or the amount of the value inside the pixel so we have mainly four types of resolution first is radio metric resolution which is the amount of information inside each pixel so information can range from 0 to 256 or it can be from 0 to 1 here you see we have a binary image so pixels can have can are either uniformly black or uniformly white so it has value either 0 or 1 and here we have different shades of black color and the next is spectral resolution now the uh, video or images you take from your cell phone usually have three bands but satellite sensors are much more advanced they can capture more bands like 10 10 number of bands or 100 number of bands we can call them as a multi spectral image or a hyper spectral image and they capture different types of information from the earth surface the other one is temporal resolution it defines the time it takes for the satellite data set to complete a whole revolu uh, revolution ar around the earth and revisit the same area <clears throat> so more our temporal resolution is the lesser it, the time it takes and then we have a spatial resolution so it represents the area by a pixel like if a pixel represent a small car it would be a high resolution as compared to a pixel which can represent a large house <clears throat> so there is a trade off between temporal and spatial resolution now if you take uh, a video from your cell phone and you take it on a very high resolution like 8k resolution you won't be able to take it on a very high fps like 60 fps or 90 fps you will get a lot of motion blur and noise or if you reduce the resolution of those images you will be able to do that in a high fps similarly if a satellite is orbiting at a very fast speed you won't you won't be able to capture images at a very high resolution this is how there is a trade off between these temporal and spatial resolution now with the help of super resolution model we can increase the spatial resolution now why do we need to increase the spatial resolution because high resolution imagery is quite expensive what it means that it would require you to send a larger uh, sensor to the space which would result in a more payload for the rocket and the launch would be expensive and not only that it would also take a lot of time for the uh, high resolution data to send to the ground station and would require more storage for that and to overcome the trade off between temporal and spatial resolution just like we saw in the last slide and we can even enhance the legacy data so there are various sensor which were launched in the past and they were not quite advanced so we can enhance that data with the help of super resolution model and of course we can do the better analysis with the help of deep learning models or manually so there are various classical methods which can be used for this uh, super resolution <coughs> like uh, we have interpolation method like nearest neighbor bilinear and bicubic 
We can do that easily with the help of OpenCV library. And we have deep learning methods. So they don't not only increase the resolution of an image, they can even uh, remove the noise and compression artifacts from that image. So GANs and diffusion models are widely used for this uh, approach. And it only requires high resolution imagery in order to train and we can create low resolution imagery out of them. So let's see what is GAN based approach and how can we use that. So it contains a generator and a discriminator. Now this takes a low resolution image and generator generates a high resolution image. Initially if it is not trained it can generate a random image. And and then we pass a, a generated image and a high resolution image to a discriminator which identify whether the image is generated by a generator or it is an original high resolution image. So after a few steps of loss, it will, be not, it will not be able to identify whether the high resolution image is passed or whether the image is generated by a generator. Now this is how uh, a GAN based model gets trained. So, this training is quite unstable, but it is fast as compared to a latest diffusion based models. Now let's see how diffusion based models work. Now it is based on a forward and reverse diffusion process. Once we have a high resolution image, we can add noise to that high resolution image which generates a noisy image, which is known as forward diffusion process. Now with the help of trained model, we can remove this noise and generate a high resolution back which will be known as reverse diffusion process. So this is how diffusion models works in a nutshell. Here how can we train this model? You can see the various steps we can do in order to train this model. <coughs> So we have an original image, a noise, and we concatenate noise to that original image and we pass it to a unit model which generates a predicted noise. The, uh, so the unit should generate what noise which we have added to this model. So after that we calculate the loss function if it has generated the correct noise or the noise is incorrect. So we use the generated and the real noise and calculate the loss and update the weights of the unit until it generates noise better. And after training the model, we use sampling, which is inferencing. Here we pass the noise to a trained neural network and mo model removes the noise from the, predicts the noise and after that we subtract the noise from the original noise. And it is done by n number of times. So iteratively, we remove noise for like 500 steps and then we can get a generated image. Now, how can we use it to increase the resolution? We can concatenate a low resolution image to a noisy image. So here we have a low resolution image like 16 by 16. We upscale it with the help of interpolation method to uh, match the resolution of the original image. And after that, we concatenate it with a noisy image. Then we pass it to a unit neural network. So this is how we can fine tune a super resolution model for our data set. So there are different approaches like uh, DDPM or SR3. So uh, you can find the complete code on the GitHub, which I'll show you in the next uh, last slide. And here we are just passing the transforms and the data loader for our model where we are resizing the image for creating a low re resolution image. And after that we are creating a unit model passing the number of input and output channels. So it can even make a high resolution image out of a multi sectoral image. And after that we have a SR3 model we are creating a class of SR3 where we are passing the required parameters like learning rate, size of image and the loss type. Now here we are passing a scheduler which will be a noise scheduler. It is quite helpful for adding noise. And then we can train it for like 800 epochs. 
Now this model is quite slow as compared to different model like a GAN based approach. But the results are quite good as compared to a GAN based approach in uh, diffusion models. Now here you can see the input which is a low resolution image and a target image what we are trying to achieve and then a prediction. Now here the model is able to generate a predictive uh, prediction based on the low resolution image and you can see uh, cars and trees and the houses are much sharper. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was so informative. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask your questions in Discord, not here, please, for company privacy. And Mayank will reply questions on Discord later. Thank you for your understanding. The remaining sessions will be in forum hall. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.